Open your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, as we'll be talking about living in the war zone. You see, in our world today, we are definitely living in a war zone when it comes to this COVID-19. In some areas of of our country, they're on lockdown. No coming, no going at all, or at least to a very minimum. Those of us that are in some of the other areas are at a stay-at-home order that seems like we're not to come or go, but it's to minimize any interaction with others And if we do interact, it is to be six feet away. Now, as much as possible. And so we are at war with this virus as our enemy. Now, I've never experienced what it's like to live in a true war zone. But I have seen in documentaries about war zones, and it's not as pleasant as we have it here. It's very similar in some ways, but really not the same. And so the point is, is that this virus, the war that we are fighting overseas, though it is just something that is to be avoided at all costs and or it will take us down. But on the other hand, I think that those of us who are Christians understand that we are living in a war zone when it comes to our enemy, the devil. That's right. We're living in a war zone as Christians, and we are calling it a spiritual warfare. Now, our enemy is identified by Jesus as the devil in Matthew 13, 38 and 39. And as we live here upon this earth, as long as we live here, we're going to have to battle the evil one, to do battle with the devil. So what does it mean to live in the war zone? How is it that we can be successful in the war zone in combat? Well, Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18 to wage a good warfare. He would then say in chapter 6 and verse 12, the fight the good fight of faith. But then we come to 2 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4 where Paul said, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. There are just some components of being a soldier of Christ that I want to share with you tonight, if you will. And I want us to begin by talking about how we must be strong as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. Look at verse 3. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Two things that come to mind here is first the expectation of a good soldier. And then secondly, the education of a good soldier. Number one, we look at the expectation of a good soldier. You see, by way of expectation, Paul says, first and foremost, we need to expect hardship. That's just granted, isn't it? As a good soldier, there's going to be some hardship. There have been a lot of folks that throughout the years that have gone to war, they've been in the war zone. They have been in combat, and some have even been involved in hand-to-hand combat. Even those today who are soldiers understand that there are the hardships associated with being a soldier. It's never easy. As a matter of fact, Paul would then tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus would say on the Sermon on the Mount that those who follow him need to expect hardship or suffering. And so we understand that we are in the combat zone, that we are in the war zone, and that we're fighting the devil. Now John said in 1 John 5 and verse 19, that the whole world lieth in darkness and under the power of the evil one. As some translations read, the world lies in darkness and the world is engulfed in spiritual darkness. And so we have to expect hardships Because as Jesus said, the world hateth me, and because it hateth me, therefore the world hateth you. 
John 15, 19. And so we're involved in war. We're to face some hardships as we live for the Lord. There are people that are going to seek to encourage us to compromise our convictions. The devil's behind that. There are some that want us to compromise our standards. We need to understand we can't do that. When it comes to the truth of God's word, it is the truth. It is absolute. We can't, we can't compromise on our convictions or on our standards. Because as a result, if we did, we may suffer for it. Then there's the second thing that not only will we face hardships, but we're going to face heartache. That's right, heartaches. You see, those who have been on the battlefield, so to speak, they can tell you about the heartaches that they have experienced. I mean, they have experienced some, th- some wild things out there. I mean, they can tell you about friends that they have served with side by side, where some were injured, some were debilitated, some had other- others just lost their lives, period. And they saw it happening right there before them. There are the heartaches along the road as a good soldier of Christ. We have to, we need to have certain expectations. Number one, we have to expect hardship. Number two, we have to experience some of the heartaches along the way. But when the Apostle Paul wrote to first, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, he talked about Hymenaeus and Alexander who had been made shipwreck of their faith. And it was interesting that when you go to 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, he talks about Hymenaeus and Philetus, and he said, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. And so you look at the life of the Apostle Paul here. You think about those he served with. And Paul had the opportunity to serve with a lot of people. A lot of great soldiers. And there were some casualties along the way. In fact, we can go to 2 Timothy 4. We can look at verse 2 there, verse 10. And he would talk about Demas. Demas at one time had been a fellow laborer. Philemon 1 and verse 24. They had been in the trenches together, serving and working together. But in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, listen to what he says. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So when we think about living in the war zone, we are in a war zone. We are to expect hardship. It's not going to be easy. Am I saying that it's impossible to live a Christian life? No. I'm saying that there can be difficulties. There are going to be things that we will face. There are going to be obstacles that we have to overcome. There's going to be heartaches where there will be people if, that will disappoint us at times. But then we need to understand there are going to be times when we get discouraged. We need not to lose heart. We need not to lose heart. We need to hang in there. And so the expectations of a good soldier and then the education of a good soldier. Two things here. First and foremost, I think about the good soldier is one who is always ready. He's always ready. My encouragement would be is to be ready. If you go out into the battlefield, you best have the things that are necessary to go out on the battlefield. You don't want to go out there empty handed. You need to be on guard. You need to be vigilant. Soldiers are to be prepared for the enemy. They don't know what's going to happen. They are, they are to be prepared in terms of what to look for. You've got to be ready, don't you? You've got to understand that the enemy will do everything. Let me tell you, the enemy is prepared. The enemy will always be prepared. You need to be prepared. The enemy will do everything within his power to get to you. Let me tell you, the devil never sleeps. The devil is prepared. The devil will do everything that he can. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, 
that we're not ignorant of the devices of Satan, lest he were to gain advantage over us. We need to show how the enemy operates. You've got to be, we, we've got to know how the enemy operates. You've got to be ready. You've got to be on guard. You've got to be vigilant. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 5a when he told us to be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's right. Earlier, we talked about how there are expectations in the war zone. And there's also the need for education. The education is to be ready. You've got to be ready for anything. And if you let down your defenses for just a short minute, you'll lose your life on that battlefield, guaranteed. And so you have to be ready. But then number two, you have to be resolved as well. You've got to have this attitude that you're not going to give up on this battlefield. I'm not going to give up. That's just sometimes you've got to repeat in your mind over and over and over. I'm going to... I'm going to be resolved to not give up. That's what, that's what we need. There are some folks that give up. Sometimes individuals get to a point that they just don't want to be on the battlefield. There is the story of some guys who came up with an idea that if they, could just, if they would just cut themselves, then they would not have to go to battle. But what they didn't know is that when they did cut themselves, they went to the... To the um, medical unit to be fixed up but as soon as they got fixed up they sent them to the brig that's the military prison military jail basically and the reason for doing that is because they were destroying government property I want you to understand that when you join the service whatever it might be when you have made that commitment you're going to be in that, that military service you have now become government property. And if you go cutting yourself, you are destroying government property. When you sign up as a Christian, you are in effect a disciple of Christ. You now belong to the Lord. And we're told that we should not defile this, this body that God has given us. That we should be treating it well so that we can look forward to the new body. See, when you sign on as a Christian, you're, you're saying, I belong to the Lord. And so because you belong to him, you've got to have the resolve to come, what may, that you're not going to give up. Jesus said to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. And that means that if it will cost you your life in the war zone, then so be it. You give your life. But you need to understand, though. In so doing, you can expect a crown of life. Revelation 2.10. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, he said, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so be ready and then just be resolved, be resolved that you're going to make it. There's a second thing I want us to see, and that is the single-mindedness of a good soldier of Jesus. Look at verse 4 again of 2 Timothy 2. No man that worth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, when you get... When you get out into the world, the war zone, you've got to concentrate, don't you? I mean, you've, you've got a good soldier concentrates. And that is we've got to have our mind alert to the enemy. And there's a reason for that. You think about all the things that the devil can throw at us, literally. John talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The very three avenues, 1 John 2.16 that, this, that Satan uses to try to win us over to his side. Or he doesn't really care about his side. He just wants you away from God. And he said, these things are not of the Father. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these are not of the Father, 
but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. And so the devil has a lot of tools that are in his arsenal. And he seeks to bait us, to hook us, so to speak. So we've got to be alert. We've got to concentrate in the war zone. And here's why. Because just like those troops that go overseas to serve on behalf of our country so that we can be safe, so that we can continue to worship freely. When they leave America and they go on foreign soul, the only thing that they're thinking about is getting back home. That is first and foremost in their mind at all times. I can't wait to go home. Our thought price ought to be the same. Because as a Christian, we are out here in the war zone. We've got to be alert to the word of the devil. And our goal and our thought process ought to be, I just want to go home. Well, what home are we talking about? We're not talking about here in America. We're talking about going to that heavenly home. We're fighting the devil here in this war zone, here on this earth. But there is a heavenly home and I want to go there. I know you do too. But that's what we got to think. That's what's got to be in our thought process. Have you seen the soldier who has come home after being gone for a long time? That the first thing they do, and I've seen it many times, they'll kneel down on the ground and they'll kiss the ground. You see, they're back home. They're glad to be home. They're glad to be where they know that they're safer than they were when they were overseas. Isn't that wonderful to think about? They're glad to be home. Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. That's right. Here on earth, no. In heaven. Whence also we wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand that ultimately, home for us is not America. It's not Clearwater, Florida. It's heaven. And we are wanting to get home. Some of you have battled cancer. There have been a number of folks in this congregation that have battled cancer. And of course, there are many, many others out there in the world and have been successful. They won the battle. I love to hear people who have beaten cancer to make this statement. I am a survivor. I love that. You see, as a Christian, you're out there in that war zone. And you're fighting the devil. And the devil is literally just throwing everything at you. And he's doing everything within his power to destroy you. And to hurt you. And you just keep overcoming time and again. And there's coming a day. There's coming a day. When you can say. Finally. I am a survivor. Oh it's a daily task. I understand. But one day. On Judgment Day, unless the Lord comes back before then, you'll be able to say, I am a survivor, and I have now gone home. There's coming that day. I know you get up at, you go to bed at night, you say, I am a survivor. You get up the next day, you go back to war, war, back on the battlefield, you go, you go to bed that night, you I am a survivor. And so you've got to concentrate, you've got to be aware of your surroundings. You've got to understand it's a tough world out there. And so we, we've got to concentrate to be a good soldier. But then I need to, we need to understand that there's going to be some challenges, right? Challenges in being a good soldier. The Bible talks about a lot about the devil and his work. Do you remember that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had faced the devil head on? That there was a showdown that's recorded in Matthew 4 and, and Luke 4. And when the devil tempted Jesus, there were three specific times that every time Jesus would respond by saying, it is written. That's right. He would always go to the word of God to, to be able to battle Satan, to battle the devil. The devil wanted to destroy the work of Jesus. You've got to understand as you think about the challenges that we face, we need to look to the Word of God as well. But there's also the deceptiveness of the devil, of the enemy. Those who are on foreign soil, they're fighting overseas. They understand the very tactics 
of the enemy. And they'll tell you the enemy uses a lot of trickery. Now Paul in Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the schemes of the devil. I thought about why would he say put on the whole armor? Because if you don't have the whole armor on, the devil knows just where to get you to cut you off. If you don't have any protection there at the knees, he's going to cut you off at the, at the knees. If you don't have any protection here on the front, he's going, to, he's going to get you. You need to have protection in the back because the devil always is going to get you in the back. So we need to have the whole armor of God so that we will be able to stand against the very schemes of the devil. Now the devil's identified John in the book of Revelation in verse 12 or chapter 12 and verse 9 as the deceiver of the whole world. He wants to deceive you and he really doesn't care if you're young or old, male or female, if you're black and white. He doesn't care if you've been to college or never been to college. He doesn't care if your goal is to, he doesn't care. His goal is to deceive you and he's a master of that. There are people in our world today and sometimes sadly some in the church that get duped in going back into the world following some of it and being tempted to the point that they yield to that temptation they will leave the safety of the church and the spiritual blessings that are in Christ they won't they won't have the whole armor anymore of God to be able to stand against the wiles the schemes of the devil He's deceptive, but he's destructive as well. Whenever you follow the devil in this world, I can promise you one thing. He leads a wake of destruction that's far and wide. You talk about the problems that we have in our country right now. I can tell you one thing right now. We can always trace it right back to one source. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The devil misled, deceived Mother Eve. And not only was she deceived, but Adam was too. And from that day forward, you know what the human family has had? Pfft. Heartache, destruction, death. And here's the sad thing about that. The devil delights in that. There are some people that just enjoy a good fight. There are some folks that they enjoy inflicting heartache in the lives of people. They are sadistic. The devil, that's how he operates. You go back and read the book of Job. Here's Job. He's an upright man. One who feared God and turned away from evil. Everything's going well in his life. And lo and behold, here comes the devil, right? Here comes the devil. And the devil's intent on doing one thing, and that is destroying the life of Job. Turning Job away from God. There were things that were precious to him, that is Job, his family and his friends. You can talk about the material possessions that he had, his servants, all of these great things. And the devil delighted in trying to destroy his life. He delighted in destroying the lives of even people today as well. And so there are some challenges that we face today. But we think about Job there, right? Job stood fast and overcame. He could honestly say, I am a survivor. There's a third thing I want you to see very quickly. And that is that we have to be submissive as good soldiers in Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 4. No man that worth entangled himself for the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. A good soldier, first and foremost, understands the rank of his superior officer. Who is our commanding officer? Do we have somebody that outranks us? We do, don't we? 
And that is Jesus the Christ. He is identified by Paul as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, 1 Timothy 6.15. He's a sovereign king. And so as our superior officer, whatever he says, goes. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. By that, I simply mean he outranks us. All authority has been given unto him in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. God the Father said that this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew 17, 5. And so what God in heaven is saying is this. My Son, he's your commanding officer. Whatever he says, that's what you're going to do. That's what goes. There have been a lot of troops in days gone by that have been submissive to their superior officers. But on the other hand, there have been some that have been cavalier. And they had the idea that they could do things their way. And guess what? They ended up in the brig. You don't buck your superior officer. And so that's a lesson that some folks need to learn even in the church. What the Lord Jesus says goes. We need not to buck and try to outrank our superior officer, Jesus the Christ. And then there are the rules of the superior officer. Listen again to what Paul said. Verse 4. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. When you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, in effect, you signed up as a soldier in the army of the Lord. That's right. What you are saying is this. Whatever the Lord says, that's what I'm going to do. You're going to live a submissive life, aren't you? Here's what Jesus asked some centuries ago in Luke 6, 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and and do not the things which I say? Can you imagine somebody claiming to be a follower of Jesus, admitting that Jesus outranks them, but he has rules in place that must be obeyed, and then in a very cavalier way, they say, well... You know, that, that really doesn't matter. I, you know, sometimes I even wonder if Jesus even knows what he's talking about. It, you see, it doesn't work like that. Toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's right, Matthew seven twenty one. Emphasis is on the submission to the will of God. Now, what about the rules? Are there rules, are there laws in place that are given to us as soldiers of Christ that we must observe? Yes. Galatians 6, 2, Paul talks about the law of Christ. It is identified by James as the perfect law of liberty. This law is to reign, is to rule in all of our lives. And one day we will give an account to our superior officer, the Lord Jesus. We will bow before him And we will give an account of the deeds that are done in this body. And as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to give an account. To what we have done in this body whether it's good or bad. That's why it's imperative that we follow what he says. That we live in submission to his will. In Hebrews chapter 5 the writer said that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That's right. John in the Revelation closed this book in chapter 22 and verse 14 when he said, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, those that are good soldiers, those that are submissive to the will of God, they have the right that one day you'll be able to go into heaven and be with God and Christ, where they can say, I am a survivor. I am now home safe. Maybe tonight. Maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe you've realized that in the war zone, you've been beaten down time and time again. 
that you have been wounded, that you have been separated from your Lord Jesus Christ and you need to get back. You see, there is a way back home. There's a way back home and it's through repentance and prayer. John said that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. James said that we are to confess your faults one to another and pray for one another, James 5, 16. We would be happy to do that for you even tonight. We hope that we can. It might be that you've never obeyed the gospel. We would love to have you become a part of God's family, even if it's tonight. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Are you willing to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ? And then go down into the waters of baptism to have those sins literally washed away by the blood of Jesus. Oh, I understand that there's nothing intrinsic about that water. But it is the means by which we can be buried into Christ. So that when we rise to walk in newness of life, we become a child of God. A child of God living in the war zone against the devil because now he wants to get you back. And that you can live faithfully and to the end to receive that crown of life. Well, I, I would love to be able to help you in whatever way that we can. Just let us, let us know. If we can assist you in any way tonight, we want to be able to do that. We hope that you'll call us, write us, text us, whatever it might be. Let us pray for you. Let us, let us be here for you. And if you need to obey the gospel, let's baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins.